Because alcohol inhibits your ability to make smart and rash decisions. Like, yeah, man, you, you get in that fight, you're in that fight all by yourself. Anyway. <clears throat> all right. So, before we go any further, I want you guys to be sure to understand the process by which calcium is regulated hormonally in the blood. You better notice because it's going to be on the test. It's going to be written all kinds of ways. So you either have an increase in calcium in the blood or a decrease in calcium in the blood. If I have a decreased calcium in the blood, obviously I want to get to an increase. If I have an increase, I want to get to a decrease. What well, hormones are responsible for increasing calcium in the blood? Anybody know? So PTH gets released by the parathyroid gland. Parathyroid cells from the parathyroid gland produce parathyroid hormone that will have a positive effect on increasing osteoclast activity, which will directly break down the bone. That's called bone resorption. By breaking down bone, you're making more calcium and more phosphate available, so you get an increased calcium in the blood. When the calcium levels go too high, you have this other calcitonin produced by the parathyroid gland. Okay, calcitonin gets produced. Calcitonin will increase osteoblast activity, which will Increase bone deposition. It means you're taking calcium out and putting it into the bank. Right? You're taking it out and putting it into the bank. Versus taking it out of the bank, right? And putting it out there. Right? This is what you know, Trumponomics and Reaganomics was, you know, you give the wealthy the tax breaks and then somehow or another you know, the jobs will start showing up and then, you know, they'll use that money to generate, you know, better better paying jobs and, and the money will trickle down. If you give, you know, the, the wealthiest people the tax, the biggest tax breaks, the, that will, it'll trickle down to us. That's, that's the idea. Nonsense. Anyway, so you either have, so you either have your thyroid, your parathyroid gland, Sensing when the calcium levels are too low, releasing PTH in large amounts. And that will lead to an increase in osteoclast activity, bone resorption. Now it's interesting because this is how I learned it. Well, sure enough, what happens is that this bone resorption, that breakdown of bone, only occurs when there's a large amount of PTH. And the reality is for you to deposit bone, not only do you need calcitonin, but you need pulsatile PTH. What do I mean by pulsatile PTH? What's pulsatile PTH? Ready? Here's a spike. Spike in PTH. I break down bone. That's in a day. So let's say we're looking at activity of PTH. So let's say this is over, uh, let's say 20, so it's 12 hours, 24 hours, uh, 36 hours, 48 hours, all right? So over a 12 hour period, the small little spikes, and you get, woo, does everybody see that? See the difference? A large peak of PTH, That'll break down bone. But small amounts of PTH 
Small pulsatile amounts of PTH along with calcitonin will favor bone deposition. That's what's really going on. So when you go into my medical physiology textbook and you read this, that's how it works. Okay? So we used to, now why do I say this? Well, because when, when my mother was diagnosed with osteoporosis, she gave birth to my, my, you know, my brother and I. So she suffered from osteoporosis. So I'm trying to figure out how to combat it. So she also is a breast cancer survivor. So there were issues with using certain hormones to treat her osteoporosis. So when I was in medical school, they came out with a new hormone uh, derived from salmon. So the fish, salmon, they produce a hormone called calcitonin. We isolated that salmon calcitonin and we put it in a spray form so that it could be sniffed onto the epithelium absorbed in the, in the bloodstream through the nasal passages. It was supposed to, the, the, the studies were supposed to improve the overall bone density. Well, she took it for over a year, two years. She was part of the study. She took it for two years, and every time they did the bone density scans, she wasn't getting any better. And then they came to find out, oh, it's because you need pulsatile PTH as well. But you only get that is if you do a lot of weight-bearing, you know, you get this a lot of weight-bearing exercise, you have to stimulate this for bone deposition. Remember I told you about that? So this is where weight-bearing exercise along with pulsatile amounts of PTH and calcitonin, along with a good balanced diet, can favor bone depositing versus bone being broken down. Yes? Would that have worked if she would have gotten the weight? Like, I guess you're getting in that again. Yes, yeah, yeah. But again, it's, you know, there, there, there were still studies that were shown that even those who were doing weight-bearing exercises, they weren't getting what the results that they thought they were getting when they were doing the animal studies. So, you know, they had to go back and look. And so when they realized, they were like, oh wait, oh, it's not just calcitonin. We need pulsatile amounts of PTH as well. So in the older females that have had children, then not only do you have to combat with the calcitonin, but you have to make sure that the PTH is, uh, is working up to par. And if not, then try to give, you know, a little, and you gotta be careful because if you take too much, then the organ will just, all right, you're taking it, I don't need to make it anymore. You hear me? This is what happens when guys start taking uh, performance enhancing drugs, they shrink their testicles, right? And they can't have kids no more. Yes? I was gonna have the same question. Oh, mm -hmm. any other questions? Uh, when, when will you stop taking uh, collagen? Do you stop, stop producing? When, no, so collagen is a protein, it's not a hormone. There's a difference between hormones that are put in the bloodstream versus like protein that's just laid out there. So yeah, this idea that uh, in getting collagen injected, uh, anytime you get anything injected in excess where it doesn't belong and the cell hasn't put it there, you run the risk of having some kind of inflammatory reaction. This is where you get some of these women, they get their, their lips, they want their lips fuller, right? Or maybe they got flat butt, they want to, the, you know, they get the, you know, they get, get collagen implants and so you make the, the butt look fuller. But if you notice then after a time, man, they start looking really beat up, don't they? And in some cases, man, it gets really, really bad. Like it, it'll look like, you know, like in some cases, it'll look like somebody literally punched them like they got into a fight in an altercation and they're suing the doctor. But the doctor I'm sure has explained to them that every time I inject you, you run the risk. It happens too, some people, they know that they can only get these injections like the Botox injections, which release the tension, but they can only get it done so many times in the doctor's office. So what they do, they go from one doctor's office to another doctor's office, and then they wonder why they, they and their face is starting to change. Because it's inflammatory reactions, guys. You, you don't wanna, hey, live with the wrinkles. I know it's hard, right? But hey, you got lots of wrinkles, you got lots of wrinkles. I live with every wrinkle of your scar. Oh, well, don't like it, don't look at it. It's as easy as that, right? That's my personal view on it. That's it, I am who I am. You don't like it, don't look at me. That's as easy as that, right? I mean, it's just, because you, you're just running the risk. I'm not saying that's going to happen to you, but anytime you get that Botox, right? I mean, that, that one, that last time, you know, that last time will literally be repeat your last time, right? Because the next time you're going you're gonna to be regretting it because, you you know, you're looking like Rocky Balboa, right? <laughs> After Rocky the 15th. <laughs> <laughs> you see some of these people, they're like, wow, that's, that's wow. That's, oh my gosh. 
You feel bad for them. But, you know, it's a whole other issue with them. Sorry. So this is pulsatile PTH, guys. <laughs> pulsatile PTH. And this is just a massive signal. This is a large PTH spike. The large PTH spike, guys, is going to favor breakdown of bone. Bone resorption is breakdown. Bone breakdown. Don't let it, don't let it freak you out. You, you can't look that up in the dictionary because it doesn't exist in the English dictionary. You gotta look it up in the medical dictionary. I remember I told you that before. Bone resorption is bone breakdown. And by me breaking down the bone, and I'm gonna I'm gonna liberate calcium into the blood. Okay? I'll liberate calcium into the blood. Now, how does skin act? How does skin act on this? How does skin act on this process? How is skin's role in this all? Okay, so skin produces vitamin D. So skin upon exposure, UV exposure, small amounts, moderate amounts of UV exposure, you're going to produce vitamin D inactive. And the, and the vitamin D inactive, it goes to the kidney. Plus PTH. Then you make vitamin D active. And vitamin D active will go to the, the gastrointestinal system, predominantly the large intestine. It's all right in there. It tells the large intestine increase calcium absorption from diet. Everybody see that? So you see here? There's that link. Bless you. Bless you. So there are PTH doesn't just go tell the osteoclast to increase its activity. It goes to the kidney, and PTH in the kidney itself will increase calcium absorption from what is going to be, or what would be, urine. So not only does it stimulate osteoclast to break down bone to increase calcium concentration, the hormone itself goes to the kidney, tells the kidney to absorb from what would be urine, calcium. Right? Uh, what, would, what would be calcium in urine, it will absorb it. And then separately, the PTH, since it's already in the kidney, will activate vitamin D, and vitamin D will go to the large intestine and tell the large intestine to absorb calcium from the fecal material. So this is all the ways in which we're gonna increase calcium in, in the bloodstream so that we can then what? Deposit it into bone. We're going to increase it because it's low. Once we increase it, then what we're going to do, we're going to lower it we're going to, by depositing it into bone. Remember, we're taking it out of circulation and putting it into, the, into our reserve. And the bone is our reserve. Everybody understand that, guys? Make sure you notice. We're going to be on the test, guaranteed. All right? And it's, I'm recording it now on the video, so no excuses. I'll erase it now, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A good go? Yeah. All right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's talk about vertebra. Talk about the skull. There's the exploded skull there. There's your vertebra. Now wait, this vertebra, it's got a lot of stuff in there. Does anyone agree? What is this? What do they call that right there? Spinal cord. Spinal cord. See that? So you see the arch, guys, in the vertebral body? That's why it's made. Watch this. One center of ossification, another center of ossification, another center of ossification, another center of ossification, another center of ossification. Another center of ossification. Everybody see that? Multiple centers of ossification working together. One, two, three, four, five, as in, a, and then they grow together to create the ring. 
Ever see that? They grow together to create the ring. And the, and the bodies of the vertebra are on the front. Sorry. So here we go. So now I gotta talk about this. I'm sorry, but I gotta talk about when mom and, got, mom and dad got together and did this wild thing. <laughs> All right? Because that's how we hear our guy here. And when that embryo was created, it was a single cell, fertilized, potent, able to divide, mitotically active, go through cell cycle, two at times. Went from one cell to two, two to four, four to eight, eight to 16, 16 to 32, 32 to 64, 64 to 128, 128 to 256, 256 to 512, 512 to 10, so on and so forth. Two end the number, two end the number, two end the number. Now, that cell becomes the embryo. Does everyone understand that? But to get to the embryo from a single cell is a complex process. So one single fertilized cell. One single fertilized cell. And then over here, an embryo. Eight weeks. This whole thing. Eight weeks. Eight weeks all it takes. The end of eight weeks is size of a quarter. Size of a quarter with all the fingers and toes, no tails. Everything already kind of pre-planned out. Heart, everything. Eight weeks. Two months, that's all it takes. And most women don't even know they're pregnant at two months. And that's when they realize that they're pregnant. Uh, what's their main complaint? They wake up in the morning, yeah? Morning sickness. Before the fact they didn't realize they missed their menses. They just realize they're sick. Then they realize, oh man, no wait. Oh, I didn't have my monthly last month, and it's coming this month. I had it this month. Oh my gosh, I'm two months pregnant. <laughs> yeah, that's how it is. Two to three months, usually in the first trimester. All right. So now, a single fertilized cell to an embryo. How does that, man? How how do we go from cell to this? Amazing, isn't it? Well. Somewhere along the way, somewhere along the journey, I told you, 2N. 2 to the N power. Cell cycle division. Mitosis. Everyone agree? That's how we got there. That's how we get there. Several mitotic divisions. And then what do we do? We create a two-layer disc. A two-layer embryonic disc. Now, I'm skipping a lot of steps. A lot of the steps are... And you go from one cell to two, two to the other, and you get this solid ball of cells, guys, yeah? So you get a solid ball of cells. And then something happens where there's fluid starts to accumulate. So you get a solid ball inside a hollow ball. So let me write that in. Let me write that in before I do this. So if I go mitosis, I go solid ball of cells. And then fluid accumulates. So fluid accumulation then creates a hollow ball with a small solid ball inside. Everybody hear me? That solid ball inside is referred to as the inner cell mass, the ICM. That inner cell mass. That inner cell mass is going to create a two-layer disc and then a three-layer disc. Again, I'm skipping steps. I'm just trying to give you the skinny. See how complicated it is, though? We went from a single cell, single cell, <clears throat> fertilized cell, to a solid ball of cells, to then a hollow ball of cells with a small solid ball inside of it, similar to like any baby ball. Anybody see the baby ball? They got a ball, they got a, like a, a, a bell inside the ball. So when you shake the ball, it makes noise. They got them for dogs too, right? And cats, right? Did it, did it, uh, you imagine uh, the, Chinese the gerbils, the, yeah, the, 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 the medicine balls. Yeah, when you get the medicine balls, when you get, and um, just imagine like a gerbil, the gerbil ball. You know, you get the gerbils, you put the gerbil, you want your gerbil exercise, right? Because he's always in the cage, you get him to exercise. Uh, drive the gerbil crazy, right? 
So you want to take the gerbil, you want him to have that experience outside the cage, right? So you put him in a ball, and he, goes, he starts walking around, right? And the ball's just traveling everywhere, right? And the gerbil's traveling everywhere. Guys, you know what I'm talking about? Hamsters and gerbils, you put them in that hamster ball. Imagine that hamster ball. It's a hollow ball, right? Well, the hamster's the solid ball. You got me? That's what's going on here. We are the hamster inside the ball. We just don't know it yet. You got me? So we start by making two cell layer discs. And then from two cell layers, we make two, three cell layers. And that three cell layer disc, that three layer disc, has names to the layers. One is called ectoderm, one is called mesoderm, and one is called endoderm. Now, ectoderm, guys, is going to give rise to the skin of the body and the brain and spinal cord of the body. Everybody hear me? How does it do this? Uh, so everybody listen. This is how it works. So one day, here's my ectoderm. There's my mesoderm. There's my endodermal epi epithelium. The mesoderm is sticky. It's got cells in it, but it's got extracellular matrix. It's sticky. Sticky stuff. And one day, mesoderm creates this thing called a tube. Sticky tube. Right down the midline of the disc. Can everybody hear me? Smack dab in the midline. Midline of disc. Right smack dab in the middle line of this. It's going to create this tube, just tube of connective tissue called the nodo cord. Everybody hear me? Everybody ready? Mesoderm condenses the connective tissue down, creates a noto cord. Noto cord calls up the, the ectoderm. Ectoderm, what's up, man? What you doing today? Chilling, man. I'm waiting on you. Yeah, 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 I, got, I made this nodal cord. What you mean, chilling, waiting on me? I, I made nodal cord. Come on, man, get it together. I'll bet, you're right, you're right. So then the ectoderm, what does it do? It creates these edges on either side of the nodal cord underneath it. And then brings those edges to the midline and pulls the bottom of that plate. So it creates this plate with these edges and then brings the edges to the midline over and creates a tube. It sits right above the nodal cord. And that tube, guys, will be the neural tube. Did everybody hear me? And that neural tube is gonna be your brain and spinal cord. So the overlying ectoderm, the overlying ectoderm gets called upon the nodal cord to fold. So here's what happens. The cells that are here, the epithelial cells that are here, they get signaled by the nodal cord. Nodal cord says, the ectoderm says, all right, bet, let me make these leading edges of these cells. And those leading edges are going to move towards the midline. Now right, we're talking midline. Well, ultimately, when it's said and done, the cell layer will reconstitute itself, and what will have come down is your neural tube. And that neural tube came from ectoderm. They call that process neuralation. Did everybody hear me? Neuralation, making a neural tube. You gotta make a neural tube. Now watch, what, what, what is the nodal cord? Does anybody know what the nodal cord would be? What do you think the nodal cord would be, guys? The precursor to all your vertebrae. Did everybody hear me? The precursor. The nodal cord, guys, is nothing more than the precursor to all your vertebrae. So, sort of like, remember how we talked about long bone, right? How long bone, we need cartilage at the ends, yeah? yeah. So, we got to make it cartilage first and have the bone cells come in, yeah? Mm -hmm. Well, when we make the nodal cord for the vertebral column, did everybody hear me? When we make the nodal cord for the vertebral column, we already know that the nodal cord isn't gonna last forever. Did everybody hear me? It's there as a precursor to vertebral column. Did everybody hear me? Man, we talked about long bones, we talked about skull, now we're talking about vertebrae. So what do I want? I want bone cells to come in. Does everyone agree? 
but not everywhere. You don't you don't see me have ball. This is real, by the way. So any any of you want to come up here and touch it, be my guest. All right. I know you rarely get ever get to see a real skeleton, and this is a real skeleton of a real human being. Thank you very much for your gift. I much appreciate it. I'm not joking. So you see this vertebra? These vertebra guys, they got you see how they're segmented? There's a there's a disc in between each one. See that? Except for what? The first one. Does everyone agree? First one's got no disc. Well, top of the skull has those little bumps leading downwards, right? Right. So when I take the skull off. Oh, oh my god. See those two bumps right there? That's the occipital condom. And C1. Well, here's C1. A ring. No, it has no, it has no body. It has no vertebral body. Because the vertebral body of C1 is right there on C2. It's a little jump, right? That pops up. That's what allows you to do this. Like this. So you see this movement here, like that? That little movement right there. Just that little degree of movement, the no. And then the yes is occipital. Like this. Just a little bit. Like this. So that's C1. That's at, uh, occipital on C1. And this is C1, C2. C1, C2. Everybody got me? So there is no vertebral body on C1 because the vertebral body of C1 fused to the vertebral body of C2. They call that the dens. Remember, we yeah. talked about that, right? So the C1 is different than all vertebrae because it has no body. The C2 is different, well, because it has the dens. But all cervical vertebrae are the same because they have transverse processes with a transverse foramen that has a blood vessel running through it. Did everybody see that? They so call that the vertebral artery. artery. What's that? You said only the cervical artery? Only the cervicals. That's how you can tell the cervicals. So you look at the cervicals, you look at the transverse process. Well, is it accurate that the first bone that pops out is the end of your... That's the C7. That that's, C7. Prom that's the spinous process of C7. It's a, that's how you look. That's how you can tell. Bifid spinous process. Large and bumped and predominant, that would be C7. And how do I know I'm at C7? Well, look, I got a vertebral, I have a transverse process with a transverse foramen in it, so I gotta be cervical. Mm -hmm. So this has to be C, C7, right? And how do I know that? Well, if I look at the spinal cord, I'm gonna find the beginning of the lateral gray horns. You're gonna learn about these later. They'll be the site of preganglionic sympathetic neurons that are gonna extend out to the, to the organs of the body, to the heart and the blood vessels and the smooth muscle of the GI wall and everything else. So we're going to learn about this later. So as you can see, the spinal cord, guys, is protected. Did everybody see that? So now watch. I'm going to draw uh, to my best. I'm going to use a little red. So here's what it looks like. I got my neural tube. I'm going to draw it as blue. I'm just going to draw it as the neural tube. Shade it in completely. Then I have what? My notochord. There's my notochord. But the notochord is just connective tissue, and that's not good enough. We need bone. So I'm going to need bone cells to come in, but the bone cells aren't going to be everywhere. If they were everywhere, then your vertebral column would be fused, and that's called ankylosing spondylitis. That's a form of rheumatoid arthritis. Like, like your spine is a long one, pretty much? It, yeah, it just fuses. And, and instead of having fibrocartilage, then it just it gets taken over. Thank you. So what happens? Where bone is where bone is found, no notochord. Everybody hear me? So in embryological development, we create the notochord, knowing that the notochord will be taken over. Just like we made the, all the long bones cartilage, knowing that they were going to be taken over by cartilage, except that the ends and the zones of growth. Everybody get me? Yes, it's a template. So we make the template, and then we know that that certain parts of that template are going to be taken over by bone, and others are not going to be taken over by bone. They're going to become fibrocartilaginous. But the middle part, the middle part of the vertebra will be the notochord. So what's left in the adult skeleton of the notochord is the actual center of your intervertebral discs. 
So when you look at your intervertebral disc, guys, um, one, if this is if this is going to be notochord, then it gets taken over by bone. So I now have a vertebral body. I'm going to have centers of ossification. Everybody see that? I'm going to create a ring. So I create the ring. I fuse these bones to get these pieces of these ossification centers together. Right. And I got my ring. There's transverse process. And the blue would be the, the, the cord, the spinal cord? The spinal cord, uh huh. Okay. That would be your spinous process. So now you have this part called the pedicle, this part called the transverse process, this part called the, the lamina, and this part spinous process and this the vertebral body now where the vertebral body are not did everybody hear me where the vertebral body are not you're going to find the intervertebral discs well the intervertebral discs they're going to sit here and you got this ring of fibrous connective tissue that ring is called the annulus fibrosis, the fibrous ring. But the inside of that ring, guys, the inside of that ring is a gel filled sac, which is remnant. notochord and they call that the nucleus pulposis <coughs> so every intervertebral disc will have in its center what was left of the notochord did everybody hear me and that it's a gel filled sac so it man it, it works really good at at compression matter of fact it works so good it works so good that it'll do this. It'll, if you, if you have through poor body mechanics, it can actually squeeze through the, the fibrous ring. That's what they call a herniated disc. That's three of my discs. I haven't already been operated on. I have a huge scar on my spine. So, so I've had three herniated discs. Leads out or when it pops out? No, it's when the gel itself, the pressure inside the gel will break Right. the belt that's surrounding it mm -hmm. and then when it comes out because it's pressing out in a direction that's not strengthened and there's nerve coming out from here there's nerve coming out right there then you then you get the compression of the nerves right. and then if it herniates to the back then it'll compress the spinal cord or the spinal nerves as they're coming down depending on what area you're talking about because remember spinal cord is up here but when you get down to here at around L5, L, sorry, L3, the spinal cord ends. And, and the nerves are, are being stretched down. So there's that space. That's why you can, we can actually go in and draw fluid out. Because if, if the spinal cord did not end at L3, then we wouldn't have any place to be able to do a spinal tap. We would damage the spine anytime we wanted to get samples of fluid from the, sp from the spinal cord. So luckily, we're born... So this is the thing. Our spinal cord and our vertebral column are born of the same length. When we're born, they're born the same length. But as we get bigger, the, each vertebral body will grow. Everybody understand that? And that will, what that'll do is that'll make the vertebral column longer, but the spinal cord does not grow with the length of the, the vertebral column. So as, the, as these bodies get bigger and the vertebral column gets longer, the spinal cord actually has its nerve stretched at the bottom. Because the spinal cord is can will only reach a certain length. And once that length is reached, then it will no longer grow any further. But it, as the bones grow, they'll stretch those nerves out. Okay? And you'll we'll, you'll learn about this when we get into the nerves and we talk talk about it. But why do I talk about this now? Why am I talking about neuralation now? Ah, because for me to properly form my spinal column. 
I need to have my spinal cord present from the initial onset. Did everybody hear me? So if I have a problem with my vertebral column, so there are kids that are born that they'll have a patch of skin on their back that has hair. It looks like, you know, you ever see those, those jackets, those old school prep, prep school jackets that got the suede patches on them? It looks like that. They'll have a skin, dark pigmented skin layer, round, with hair on it. And that's an indicator of spina bifida. Well, spina bifida, guys, is actually when you have issues with the closure of the bone, then the nerve, then the, then the, sorry, then the spinal cord never sits in its proper place. And if it doesn't sit in its proper place, then it can be outside where it needs to be. And that can cause damage to the spinal cord itself and to the function of the spinal cord. The, the best